Hey everyone, Ty back again with another bonus episode of Listen Live this week. We are chatting with our very own Jimmy Simpson Jr. Um, today about having tough talks with loved ones. So Jimmy actually uh, has been with our organization since the very beginning. If you know us as a storytelling story hour organization, you for sure have seen Jimmy already. Um, he has hosted all of our galas in the past, and he's also been the MC of our San Francisco Story Hours since the beginning. Um, Jimmy has been really critical in shaping this organization, the content behind it, the strategies um, on how to share stories, on how to effectively talk to people um, in storytelling form, on how to craft a story. Um, and he's actually joined our story coach team um, since in addition to being an MC and has been working with all of our storytellers since the beginning on formulating their story in a way that is accessible, that reaches out to people, that touches people's hearts and minds. So I'm really excited to have Jimmy on with us today. Um, just a preview. So Jimmy is actually going to be hosting our Listen Live episode this Friday. Um, he will be interviewing a colleague of his and a former colleague of his um, about I will, I'll let Jimmy, let me add Jimmy now, and then he can talk about, he can introduce this stuff on his own. Um, appreciate everyone for joining in right now. All right. And these talks are always so interesting because I have to touch the screen at the same time um, as talking, and I am not that coordinated. Okay. All right. Let me just... Hey there. Hello. How's it going? Good. I don't know why I feel nervous. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's because we, we don't do this as often anymore. Okay, I'm going to lower myself on my chair because every time it adds a new person, my head gets cut off. Um, thank you again for joining us today, Jimmy. It's really good to see your face. I'm going to pretend not to talk to you very formally because um, Jimmy and I some of you already know this if you've seen us interact or know both of us interpersonally, but Jimmy and I are friends um, outside of this organization. But Jimmy has also been a huge asset to this organization professionally, um, sitting on the board as one of our board members, um, being a story coach, like I already mentioned, and also just working on the back end, um, helping us develop workshops and developing our methodology. Um, so thank you through and through for the work that you do. And I just want to start off with just a quick check-in. Um, I know this is a question that you've been asked many, many times, probably in the last week or two, um, slash month or two, considering all that's been happening. But where's your meter in the world right now? Like, where's the Jimmy meter today? How are you doing? Today, I, I feel good. I feel very present. Um, I luckily have a you know wonderful support system here at home and at work. And so it's been really, I mean, obviously it's been a whirlwind and tough couple of months and um, just trying to take it day by day, recognizing when, you know, my glass is full and I can do the work and also recognizing when it's time to uh, sit back and re-energize. Yeah. And so how are, how are you re-energizing these days? Like what's your go-to other than probably turning off the news or not being on Instagram live sessions? What are you doing to maintain um, your mental and emotional health? I am maintaining my emotional and mental health by getting a kitten and <laughs> trying my best to cuddle with her as much as possible. Um, but no, also, again, just like having such a great support system with my partner and my being able to contact family. And one of the things about COVID-19 that I know we have talked about in the past that has been really um, somewhat powerful is being able, like hitting sort of the reset button with the folks who you do not connect with as often. And so I was having Zoom calls with friends in Nebraska, you know, weekly, and we were playing games online. And it was, um, it was just really cool, something that we had not done for years since I've been in San Francisco. And it took sort of that pandemic to sort of bring us all together. Yeah, I've I've noticed that as well. I think you know, for many of us, we're using this time to both pause, but also focus on what's important and the relationships in our lives that we actually don't maintain as often as we would like. Um, so I I wanted to, I just saw Danielle joined us right now. 
Um, so hi, Danielle. You, you don't know me, but I'm Ty, and obviously you know Jimmy, but I wanted Jimmy to talk a little bit about um, the Listen Live Instagram live session that you're going to be having this Friday um, with Danielle. So go ahead and introduce, you know, Danielle and give you a little bit about what you know about the story that she will be telling. Yeah, this, so first Danielle and I worked together at Education Outside, which was um, this wonderful nonprofit organization that brought environmental education to uh, San Francisco public schools. And so we worked together there for about three years and Danielle led a lot of our, well, she was a teacher and then she was also leading a lot of our recruiting and our diversity, equity and inclusion work. Um, mm. And so Danielle was one of the first people that came to mind when we were thinking about highlighting some stories uh, for the next month or so. And I was looking online and I actually found a YouTube video of Danielle and I didn't know actually about the story that she told about transformation. And she, I mean, I won't give it all away, but it takes this beautiful metaphor of, you know, the transformation in nature that we all know about a uh, caterpillar turning to a butterfly and applying that to a situation in her life um, and the transformation that she has gone through um, in these past few months and kind of taking her to who she is today um, and continuing to work through that transformation. So I'm super excited for people to tune in on Friday with Danielle um, to hear her story. Yeah, that's, you know, the theme of transformation is one that resonates with, I think, anyone who's following what's happening right now in the world, um, both from a societal level, but also on a personal level. So really excited to hear Danielle's story as well. Um, I wanted to transition since you're talking about, you know, catching up with loved ones and, and reaching out in new ways during, you know, both pandemic times, but also based on everything that's happening in terms of like racial justice in the past couple of weeks. Um, the, the topic and the theme of today's quick conversation with you is I wanted for us to have just kind of a more general discussion about how to have tough talks with our loved ones. And the reason why I wanted to have this particular discussion with you is because you told a story um, at one of our very first story hours and the first one that you emceed about this very topic on a very deep and personal level. Um, I still remember specific elements of the story. I remember, you know, like the, the shower <laughs> scene and like, sorry, that sounds really bad out of context. <laughs> you know, like specific um, parts of your journey, like when, you know, you talk to your mom um, and when you talk to your dad about this. And so can you just recap for those of us who didn't get a chance to hear your story back when you first told it, like maybe four years ago now, um, just really quickly, uh, just a summary of this journey that you had about sharing something that was very personal and important, but also happened to be very divisive about you with a certain family member of yours. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the story was basically my coming out story. And um, it was, so for those of you that don't know, I was born in Hilo, Hawaii, but uh, eventually moved to rural Nebraska, which is where my dad is from. Um, and it is a, you know, a, as stereotypical as you can think of rural America, that is, that is where I'm from. And I, I have learned to absolutely love it and cherish it and enjoy my time going back there. Um, but it was, you know, realizing through all of high school, actually like since I was as young as four, knowing that I was gay, but not being able to talk about it because knowing the repercussions that would happen both in my town, in that community, um, but I think more importantly, being afraid of what friends and of what family were going to think. And knowing that, you know, while I would watch TV at home and a gay character would be on television, hearing my father describe that gay character as, you know, disgusting or gross and that just like being something really obviously just very hard to hear um, and not sure how exactly I would navigate that. And so the story I told was about the relationship with my father, which was actually is really incredible. And throughout my childhood, it was, is, was so amazing. Um, and it turned after coming out, as, as some people would expect. Um, this man who, you know, I idolized that I played 
sports with all the time. And for those of you that know me, it's like, oh, Jimmy plays sports. Um, but I, you know, it was um, hard. I came out my freshman year of college to my family and I was met immediately with this pretty, you know, pretty wonderful response of, you know, we absolutely love you no matter what. This is hard for us to hear. It's hard for us to really understand, but, you know, we are here for you. And then over the next seven years, mm -hmm. um, recognizing that that first sort of, that first response wasn't actually true, at least for my dad. Mm -hmm. um, and that I had to continue to push him and to have tough conversations with him about my sexuality in order for him to fully understand and in order for us to either maintain or sort of recreate a relationship that, you know, that I really wanted and that I know that he wanted as well. Um, but it was, it was seven years of tough conversations. Um, and it took so much time in between. Um, and I think, you know, about having tough talks with, with people is what we're talking about today. So it, it took moments of being very upfront and being very blunt with him about how, um, about how he was treating me because of my sexuality, how our relationship had, you know, dissolved because of my sexuality. Mm. And it was moments of, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversations and then maybe months of pretending that I was not gay or pretending that I never came out. And it was this back and forth for so, so long um, until it finally reached sort of a tipping point where I recognized that for my own mental health, I had to either step away from the situation or I had to, you know, continue this uh, relationship that was so just just not it, it just wasn't deep it was a surface level relationship we were just pretending for seven years um and so we got to a point where i was going to be bringing a boyfriend home from california and i told him that and he essentially said to me that you know you can bring whoever you want home but I'm never going to accept them into the family. And you know that you are going to hell. Mm -hmm. And it was like, again, after that was seven years after I came out. And it wasn't like for those seven years, my father and I never spoke or he was mean to me or anything like that. It was, it was truly like we had a, a relationship. It just wasn't deep. It wasn't like what it used to be. And so in that moment of him, you know, telling me that I was going to go to hell or I was going or that he would never accept anyone into the family. That was where I realized I had to kind of have an ultimatum where, you know, I have been working on this and trying to have these conversations with you for seven years. And if none of that is working, then I need to step away from this relationship with my with my dad for my own mental health mm. and it it completely blew up i have never yelled at someone like that ever in my entire life i have never cried like that in my entire life and i left my family's home and drove to my best friend jessica's house and I just like cried with her, cried with her mom, uh, talked to my sister on the phone, cried with them. And in that sort of ultimatum that I gave of like, either you're going to accept this about me or you're going to lose me forever. Mm. That, I mean, unfortunately was what it took in mm. order for him to realize that he, he needed to accept this or he was going to lose his son. And it was one of the worst moments of my life, but it, it turned him, it made him realize that he needed to make a change. 
And so since then, things have gotten like so much better. And like he is, he asks about my current partner, which is just like, it feels little, but it's such a big step to recognize the relationship and to be happy that I am in a relationship. And there was, he came to visit San Francisco one time and we were driving through the Castro and he was like, oh, are the, those rainbow flags are, uh, are for the for the gays? I'm like, yeah, that's exactly <laughs> right. And- Is that the bar that you, uh, you uh, pick up on boys at, son? <laughs> um, no, we don't go that far. Uh, <laughs> But it, I, it took, so after this all happened and we sort of like, um, you know, our relationship started to form again. One, I'll share this actually moment since we were talking about like the shower. So one of the things that is <laughs> the reason why that, that was like a scene in the story is I recognized the moment that my father truly started to like care again. This is so stupid, but like it really hit me at the time. So I had been diagnosed with celiac disease, so I can't eat gluten. And I was um, taking a shower back in Nebraska at my family home. And this was like just a, a few days after this blow up. I come out um, of the shower and I see all of these groceries on the ground. And um, I like look at them and I was like, what is all of this for? And my mom was like, oh, your dad went to the grocery store and bought like as many gluten-free things as he could find. <laughs> and it was just like that little thing that made me so like recognize that he was trying. And I, again, I know like being gluten-free and being like accepting of homosexuality are not, not the same thing, but it, in this instance it was. Um, because there was a gesture behind it. Yeah, because we're not the kind of family that is like, I'm so sorry for what I said. Please forgive me. Like, let's talk about this more. That is, that's not how we interact. But that gesture, like, really meant something to me. Mm -hmm. um, and it's now taken some reflection for me to realize that that, you know, moment of giving my dad an ultimatum of, like, either you're going to accept me or you're not, that would have absolutely never happened if it weren't for those seven years of small, tough conversations along the way. It, I, I am 100% sure that that never would have happened. If I right off the bat, you know, maybe I came out and he said something, you know, homophobic, if I right off the bat would have given him that ultimatum just like a few weeks later, a month, a month after coming out, I don't know. I don't really think that I would maybe have that relationship with my dad anymore because I think that it would be, there There would be no progress made. It would be me hoping that my dad would jump from, you know, what has been ingrained into him for all of his life to accepting something completely new in this short matter of time. And it it was taxing on me to have these little conversations and to have these micro and you know, macro aggressions from my mm -hmm. own dad. But it was a relationship that I was willing to work for, but you needed to have the time in between to sort of, like I was saying in the very beginning, like fill my cup back up to have the energy to be able to have, continue to have these conversations or, over the course of seven years. Yeah. I mean, this this is something that is obviously very personal to who you are. It is your identity. It, it is a part of your identity. Um, it is a lifestyle and more. It is how you see the world. It's how you approach the world. It's how you love in the world. And I just want to draw that comparison to a lot of people right now are finding themselves having really tough conversations with family members and about something that they themselves might not identify with. Um, and, and I'm being, you know, specifically about having conversations around racial justice with the black, you know, about the black community and how some of our loved ones, parents, partners, siblings, you know, aunts, uncles, whoever it may be, like even coworkers, about something like this. And I, I just wanna draw the connection that even though for some people, it, you know, they might not be from the black community or identify as such, it is a part of their core beliefs in very similar ways. It is how they live 
in the world. It's how they present themselves as someone who cares about this. It is a part of their values. And so thank you for sharing that story once again with us, because I think just in hearing it again, it is so poignant. I draw so many comparisons. Um, I want to, I want to have a quick, you know, discussion about that point that you made of the work that you put in over seven years. And many people right now are having this renewed, both alarm and urgency, but also like vigor to have these conversations in a very intense and very short amount of time. Like, what do you, and I know you don't speak for everyone, uh, but like based on your experience, did you ever feel like previous to those seven years, like you just wanted to have that ultimatum conversation way sooner? Oh, and ab- did you get there earlier? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, but like, I also recognize, I recognized at the time that that just wasn't, it wasn't going to work with someone who has had these thoughts ingrained in them for decades since birth. <laughs> and, and it's been, you know, I mean, to m- my dad's knowledge, he had never met a gay person until he knew me. And so it's like, it's, it's, it takes time to have these conversations. And one of the things that really struck me is it was actually on the Listen for a Change Instagram, one of the quotes that you, that we posted on there about, you know, if you are a non-Black person, you do not get to cut people out of your life right now be, if, for being racist. It is a time for us to engage with the people who are closest to us, to talk to them, to challenge them, to let them know that they are, that they, that this is not an acceptable mindset. And then to have these little conversations as we go, because when you first confront that person, whether it's a family member or a friend who is saying something, you know, wild on Facebook, that first confrontation will probably not go well. And, and that's okay. Like the, the point is to start the conversation. And as a non-Black person, we need to be talking to our family members who can essentially be the ones causing harm and causing violence. Yeah. I think that that is so important. And so one of the, um, it's, it's actually really interesting. In Omaha recently, there was a killing of a young 22-year-old Black man named James Scurlock. And he was murdered by a white man who is like a known white supremacist in the community. Anyway, his, this, the murderer's cousin was testifying in front of like the Omaha City Council, I think. And she was just talking about how like this was her family that committed this murder. It was her family who did this. And she recognizes that she needed, like it was, it was just decades of her, you know, her uncles and her grandparents and her father and her un- whatever, who were yeah. building that the way that these men in her family were thinking was right. And they didn't have anyone challenging them. And so she recognized that she was too late because someone had, you know, done the ultimate worst thing that they could do. And so it's up to us to have these conversations and to take care of ourselves at the same time, but to have these conversations as we go with our friends and with our family. Yeah, and and I do wanna highlight that it is really tough. I have my own personal battles. There are people right now that I would love to have this conversation with, many different conversations, not just you know about racial justice, but many things that I believe in with regards to human rights and social justice that I'm just not ready to have those conversations. So mm-hmm. I also think right now there's an intense pressure for, yeah, you know, these, these, there is great urgency around this because every single day that we wait to have these conversations is a day that um, someone out there is hurt um, and that these beliefs are perpetuated. And oftentimes, like you use in your example, you know, it could end up in a life being lost that didn't need to be lost. And so there is kind of this like savior urgency right now, but I do want to highlight again that it is a progress. As you were talking about with your personal story um, about coming out, it's, I think a lot of people are feeling this like need to tackle all of it all at once right now. Um, 
there are a couple things that I was reading about that I found really resonant. First off was, you know, pick your battles. Because right now there are a lot of battles to fight. And by battles, I mean specifically within talking to loved ones about, you know, racial equity and justice and, and tough topics. It could be other stuff about, you know, homophobia and abortion and whatever else out there that you want to talk about. But right now, specifically pick your battles because there are a lot of people out there right now that we could be talking about these things with. And I think the shouting and, and you know, posting on social media gets to a level of people who are already kind of like feeling a certain way. And then there's past that, the people that we really are nervous to talk to, you know, for some of us, it's our parents, for some of us, it's our, you know, siblings or aunts or uncles. And I would say to that, you know, and this is what the article was saying, is that there are some people who aren't ready to hear it right now. Mm -hmm. And there are also some people who are not ready to hear it from you specifically. And so that brings me to another point is that we feel like we should be talking to anyone and everyone within our network, but our relationship isn't the same with, it, it isn't equal the way that, you know, my relationship with my dad is different than my relationship with my mom and so on and so forth. And so I also, you know, picked up what I appreciate in this article it was it was saying, sometimes you might not be that person to talk to that person about that. Um, if you're, if you have a sibling who has a better relationship with them, the relationship is just foundational. It is core because without a trusted, this is why we need to do that work and not, you know, Joe Schmo off of the street, because we have that trusting relationship. We've worked at it. And that's what you did for your whole life, but also for those seven years after coming out. And I, I suspect there was a reason why you didn't cut your dad out sooner is because that's a surefire way of never having that talk at all. You weren't sure, and I don't want to speak for you, but maybe you weren't sure that that was the right time. Do you feel like that might have been affecting, like, what was your thought process throughout that whole time? Um, yeah, it was, it was really just, a, you know, the worst fight of the worst fight to bring this up yeah. again. Like, you were probably tiptoeing around good moments and wondering when, you could possibly bring this up the right way. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, it, it, it really is exactly what you just said. And I think one of the things that I want to emphasize for all people is that you have to make sure that you are taking the time to, to refill yourself. And mm. you do not have the energy to be fighting and it's just going to be taxing on you and it's just going to affect your mental health, then you need to take a break. You need to step away. You need to give it time. When you're talking to your loved ones, like for in, in my story that I told earlier, I was able to have these conversations with my dad about my sexuality maybe once every like <laughs> like four months or something, or even maybe sometimes even longer in between. And that was because I valued, I saw someone actually ask this question in the Listen for a Change stories um, about like they want, the hardest thing about having these conversations is wanting to maintain the relationship. Right. And the only way that you can maintain the relationship is to build the relationship as you have these conversations. Mm -hmm. And that unfortunately can be super frustrating because you may not be seeing the progress that you want to be seeing in the time span that you want to be seeing it in. But it is so necessary that if you want to maintain that relationship and you want to see that person change for the better, that you have those tough conversations, take a break for yourself and even for that other person, come back to it when you feel like you have that energy again, do it again. And it's just, it's just like a rinse and repeat, do that over again until you start making, slowly making progress. Because that's the only way that we, you know, our sort of generation are, are going to be able to change minds is doing it over time, mm -hmm. creating empathy for either yourself or for the group or for, or for the people that you are trying to defend or talk about. And then just chipping away at what this person, this family member, this friend has been learning for years and mm -hmm. chipping away at it and sort of like re-educating. Right. That's such an important point. 
Um, and thank you for making it. And I want to reiterate once, once again, that one phrase that you said is that you have to continue building the good parts of that relationship as you are preparing and like chipping away at the tough parts of aspects of that relationship. And we, we have to keep in mind that these beliefs uh, weren't developed overnight, right? With your dad, you said literally like he was born into this culture from birth. And so we can't expect something that has been ingrained, something that is like a whole lifestyle, a whole value system um, for people, for them to tackle that and to have like the thoughtfulness and the, the personal care and the, the you know, um, stake in it. For them to be able to change overnight, it's, it's an impossible task. Um, and so that brings me to another point um, that I wanted to make is that oftentimes we use very logical arguments, like right now, right? Those of us who are following the news and following the memes and all of that, we have a lot of the tools and vocabulary now based on what we're learning and educating ourselves on to have very articulate, logical, well-spoken arguments as to why we believe in this or why this is right. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm speaking more broadly uh, intentionally because I want to be able to have this apply beyond this moment and also have it be able to apply beyond the issue of racial justice with the black community right now. Um, but logical arguments don't always work. Like, I mean, <laughs> with, with your personal experience, right? There, there wasn't, you did the logical argument probably at the beginning of the seven years when you first came out, you were like, this is who I am. I was, you know, and you probably laid out all the logical arguments and yet, those beliefs still stayed. And so based on, you know, your experience, what do you think about people who are trying to make very, you know, logical, like well-structured, laid out arguments with facts and all of that right now, based on what you experienced on how you tackled your conversation with your dad? Yeah, I think like, that those logical ar arguments can take you so far and eventually you have to appeal to the emotional side of the relationship. You have to figure out what is this person? What will they truly be affected by when I'm mm -hmm. having this conversation? What is something that I can bring in that I know will like touch their heart as a way to change their minds? Mm -hmm. This is, I know, like, my experience is very different and, and is not life or death. But in that sort of final conversation that I had with my dad, one of the things that I said that I had been holding back for so long, but I couldn't any longer, I said that if I get married, you will not be invited. Mm -hmm. If I have children, they will never know who their grandfather is. And that, like, I am feeling emotional talking about that because that is like, <laughs> that is the furthest that I would ever want to push someone. But it was, it was like the final straw and, and sort of the final like emotional punch that I wanted to give um, in order for my dad to really, I guess, feel that punch. And, and, and I do feel like over the course of seven years, I had like little, little appealing to his emotions throughout all of that. Um, but it <laughs> finally reached a point that I was like, I just got to lay it all out here. Yeah. But and I do think trying to find a way to emotionally appeal, it, it, it's absolutely necessary when, when you're trying to talk to someone who you already have some sort of personal relationship with. Yeah, exactly. I think that, with, you know, we're speaking specifically about talking to loved ones and not, you know, canvassing on the streets or ringing doorbells or um, speaking to a stranger at the grocery store, right? The benefit of talking to loved ones is that you have a stake, they have a stake in you. And both of you want to maintain this caring and loving relationship that both of you have. And so I don't think it's at all manipulative. I don't think it's at all, you know, like icky to really reflect upon because clearly, you know, whatever issue it is that you want to have or to discuss, it affects you emotionally as an individual to the core. 
And I think it's important for us to reflect on the ways in which it does reflect you. I mean, it, do, it does affect you and, um, you know, is emotionally resonant with you. For you, it's about who you love. It's about the family that you might raise one day. It's about, you know, like the things that you care about most deeply in this world and what you want for your, your future um, in a, having a positive, beautiful future to look forward to with your dad in it. And that's a real thing. And I think with people right now, when they're gearing themselves up to have these conversations, really reflect upon emotionally, like what does it weigh on, like how, why does it weigh heavily on you? It isn't because you read a Wikipedia article and you were like, oh, yep, that convinced me. And so now I want to make this argument on behalf of something that I'm kind of removed to. These are things that we care so deeply about. And like some of us, many of us are grieving and we're hurt and we're angry and we're fired up and we feel for our communities and we feel for our friends. And those are real things. And I, I urge people to really reflect on that. I think what you said is really insightful is that it, unless people asked for a logical argument, unless they were curious about a fact or they were, they asked you like, please define what you mean by defund the police, people usually aren't looking for a logical argument. I think of all the times in which um, I seek out logical arguments, it's usually not in the tense, like thick of things moments. Um, in those moments, the things that end up swaying me personally is when I step away from the conversation that I'm having and the argument or talk, talk that I'm having and see through to the person and realize actually I do still care about you. And even though we disagree on this right now, I actually want to understand why you feel so strongly or you're hurt by this right now. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have anything you want to add to that based on? No, I think one of the like final things is just like thinking through specifically and like thinking about how you can approach conversations about black lives mattering and thinking about me personally and knowing that I need to have these conversations with not only my dad, who I have is like no longer homophobic and hopefully in the future will no longer, my family's not in here, right? Like no longer kind of racist. <laughs> this will be recorded. We'll just link him afterwards. <laughs> I, I recognize that I now have to do the work to figure out how to make this issue somehow relate to my father's life. Like I, thinking, okay, so thinking about like the town that we are from that my parents currently live in, I'm almost positive the number of black people in that town is zero. Like I'm almost positive. And that the only interaction that my parents have with black people is when they maybe drive an hour to the nearest town and they go shopping. Like that, so in order for me- on TV. Yeah, or on TV. And so for, in order for me to figure out how to educate you know my dad or or another family member about racism spe about specifically anti-blackness that is something that i have yet to figure out but i'm hoping to be able to use this like ingrained homophobia that he had and mm. you know took 7 years to unlearn i'm hoping to <laughs> use a little bit of that framing to be able to apply it to racism mm. and and you know, because i've already used some of that for immigration for islamophobia and in these conversations with family members or friends back in i mean it doesn't even have to be in rural nebraska be right here in the bay area mm. and so I'm taking what I personally learned in my own personal experience, and I'm now trying to figure out how to apply that to these other really important issues, especially right now um, in this moment of of turmoil of of Black lives being in peril, really needing to have these conversations with my, my close family and friends. Yeah, well. It, it definitely is, it's a tough thing. It's not something that, um, you know, as you've pointed out already, can happen overnight or should happen overnight. 
I think it starts with people like us having these talks and, and finding the moments and the courage to do it. Um, I want to, I want to review some of the things that you discussed today. Um, we discussed um, with regards to having tough talks with loved ones, because I know a lot of people on here uh, just joined in, but also could use some of that refresh so that they could go out there and reflect upon the things that you had talked about. Um, first off, it's it's a long haul for you. It was seven years in talking about you know your coming out experience, but also like your sexuality with your dad and having him ultimately accept it. But it takes time. It's not something that can happen overnight. It's not something that they can unlearn immediately. Um, it's something that they have been learning for their whole lives, and so it does take progress. Um, the second thing that I wanted to highlight that you talked about was maintaining a positive relationship with them throughout, or at least as much of it as you can. Building the relationship, building the care and trust between two people, um, while at the same time chipping away slowly at it and not expecting giant truth bombs to change everything. Um, and then the most recent, uh, the third point is being really um, careful about how you approach it in terms of using logic versus emotion and that there are times in which logical arguments make sense and that there is a foundation of logic that needs to be laid out and for them to hear and for them to understand. But the long haul and the meaningful um, change comes through emotional appeals and talking about the issue as it personally relates to you and why it is so passionate for you and why it is a human rights, human justice issue that you are affected by um, and touches you. And so thank you again for joining us. And I know I learned a lot just in talking with you for you know these past 30 minutes um, as always. And again, um, Jimmy will be hosting this Friday, um, a Listen Live Story Hour right here on at Listen for a Change Stories. Um, so tune in, um, subscribe. You'll be seeing some marketing from us in the next couple of days. But thank you again, Jimmy. Any final words that you want to share? Uh, my final words are do the work, take some time for self-care, and then do the work again. Yeah. Well, awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and for those of you watching, um, you know, our organization, our hearts are with everyone. And during this tough time, we are um, having tough talks within our own organization, too, about how we can be better and how we can show up better. So I appreciate everyone joining. Um, and once again, check us out. Um, Jimmy's going to be hosting on Friday, and we'll see you all later. All right. Bye.